So these are the last notes for chapter 11. We're talking about using chi-square tests wisely. Example one says an article in the Arizona Daily Star included the following table, this guy. Suppose that you decide to analyze these data using a chi-square test. However, without any additional information about how the data were collected, it isn't possible to know which chi-square test is appropriate. So we know the data is all about social media and social networking. So it looks like it's organized into age groups and then whether or not they use social networks. Part A says explain why it is okay to use age as a categorical variable rather than a quantitative variable. Some people might look at this data and think this should be strictly quantitative, right? Age might be a quantitative uh, variable or um, we could use proportions, for example. But we actually learned this in Chapter 1. Quantitative data can be converted or just put into categories, and then we can consider it categorical data. And that's what we're doing here. Each one of these age groups is like a category. Part B says explain how you know that a goodness of fit test is not appropriate for analyzing these data. And right away, we, we know since there's either, depending on how you look at this, there's either two characteristics, which would be a chi-square test for independence, or there's two plus populations, which would be a chi-square test for homogeneity. So goodness of fit is definitely not appropriate. The goodness of fit test is only appropriate when we have uh, distribution of one variable in one population. In fact, the goodness of fit test is the basic version that only goes with one-way tables. And right away, we're looking at a two-way table, so we know that a one-way table and a goodness of fit test would not be appropriate here. It's either chi-square test for homogeneity or chi-square test for independence. Part C asks us to describe how these data could have been collected so that a test for homogeneity is appropriate. And then Part D says, how could these data have been collected so that a test for independence is appropriate? So for Part C, the homogeneity version. So that's the one that has two or more populations involved. So we could look at this as being six independent random samples one from each age category and then within those samples we ask every person whether or not they use online social networks so that's one way we could go about it for the homogeneity test and then the test would try to compare those six independent random samples to see if they were distributed the same. Or we could go the other way. We could take two independent random samples coming from the online social network users and another one where the people don't use online social networks. And then we just ask them their age. So ask every member of each one of those samples how old they are. So there's two different approaches here for the homogeneity test. You either do six independent random samples, from one from each age group, or you just do the two independent random samples, but then you have to be able to identify these groups, one strictly of online social network users, and then ask them their age, and then one of people who don't use social networks, and then ask them their age. So there's two ways to approach that one. And remember, chi-squared test for homogeneity would test whether the distributions were the same or not. So it tries to represent each one of those samples from a larger population and test whether or not their distributions are the same. Okay, so what about for the independence approach? So for the independence, you would only take one overall random sample from the entire population and ask every member their age and about online social networking. So 
You take one big sample and you ask them two questions. Uh, your age and whether or not you use social networks. So that actually seems the most reasonable and most appropriate method for data collection. So in this case, the chi-squared test for association or independence is probably the best. But we can't know for sure unless we know how the data were collected. And we didn't have that information at the start of this problem. So in a chi-squared test for independence, we do one overall random sample. We ask that sample two questions. What's their age? And whether or not they use social networking. And then we look, uh, we compare the data. We do a chi-squared test for independence to see if there's an association between those two uh, characteristics within the population. So this one definitely seems like the easiest and most effective way but again, we can't know for sure because we weren't given the background and how the data was actually collected in this example. Okay, the next example here says ibuprofen or acetaminophen. In a study reported by the Annals of Emergency Medicine, researchers conducted a randomized double-blind clinical trial to compare the effects of ibuprofen and acetaminophen plus codeine as a pain reliever for children recovering from arm fractures. There are many response variables recorded, including the presence of any adverse effects such as nausea, dizziness, and drowsiness. Here are the results. Okay, so we have the two treatment groups, the ibuprofen and the acetaminophen with plus codeine. 122 subjects in this group, 112 subjects in this group, and here are their responses, whether or not they had adverse effects. So part A asks, which type of chi-square test is appropriate here? By the way, it's definitely not goodness of fit because this isn't a one-way table. This is either homogeneity or independence. And we can say, uh, because the data comes from an experiment where subjects were randomly assigned to two different treatment groups, We'll take a look at those treatments, those two treatment groups, and test whether there's a difference in the way the two groups are distributed, which means we're going to test for homogeneity. So we want to see if the effects are distributed the same for the ibuprofen group as they are for the other group. So I've added the expected counts in here. These are the observed counts. I went ahead and added the expected counts here because part B asks us to calculate the chi-square statistic and p-value. So we can actually do that by hand in this case. So we'll start with 36, subtract the expected count, square it, divide by the expected, and then we'll go to the 57, minus the expected count, square it, divide by the expected, then 86, 55, uh, and we should be at 11.15 for our chi-square test statistic. Can't forget our degrees of freedom in this case, which would be rows minus 1 times columns minus 1. So that's 2 rows minus 1 times 2 columns minus 1 for a grand total of 1 degrees of freedom. So our p-value then, what's the probability we get a chi-square statistic greater than or equal to 11.15, which we can use the chi-squared CDF command, or you can use the table. Uh, it should be 0 0.0008. Part C, show that the results of a two-sample z-test for a difference in proportions are equivalent. So we actually did this in chapter 10. So let's start with the hypotheses for a z-test. The null would be p1 minus p2 equals 0. And then the alternative, this would be not equal to. So a chi-square is always the equivalent of a two-sided z-test here. And if we use this approach, a two-sample z-test, 
we could say where P1 and P2 are the true proportion of children recovering uh, from arm fractures that show adverse effects when taking ibuprofen or the other treatment, respectively. So we're going to let our proportions represent the proportion of children that show adverse effects from both treatments. And for the sake of brevity, we're going to assume that the conditions are met. So let's go ahead and do a two-proportion z-test for P1 minus P2. So P hat 1, the actual sample data, uh, was 36 out of 122 for the ibuprofen group, which is 0.295. And for the other group showing adverse effects, it was 57 out of 112, which is 0 0.509. So our test statistic, our z-score here, subtract those two sample proportions compared to zero, right? because we start out assuming that there's no difference in our null hypothesis. So we subtract p hat 1 minus p hat 2. And then in the denominator here, don't forget we have to get a pool proportion. So total number of successes divided by total sample size combined here. So on top that would be 36 plus 57 and then on bottom 122 plus 112 which is 0.397 as a decimal. So I'm going to use that in the denominator here for my pooled proportion. And then the sample sizes so N1 would be 122, N2 would be 112 which gives me my z-score of negative 3.339. So for the p-value, what's the probability we would get a z-score that low or maybe even lower? Well, I'm going to draw a standard normal curve. I'm going to mark off negative 3.339 for my z-score. And then I'm going to shade everything below that. So there's just a little bit of area in that tail. And then don't forget we have to double the p-value because the alternative hypothesis would just say there's a difference. It's not equal to. So I'm going to shade the positive tail as well. So I'm going to use the normal CDF command. Uh, my lower bound, I'll just use the tail down here. Negative 1E99 up to negative 3.339. So I'm just going to use that tail. And then I'm going to double the answer. Which should give me the same p-value of 0 0.0008 when I'm done. So we just showed that this was equivalent to the chi-squared test that we did in part B. Notice that only works though because we only have two treatments in this case, right? We could do P1, which was 36 out of 112, and then P2, which was 57 out of 112. First one's out of 122, actually. If you have any more than two groups, you're going to want to go ahead and do the chi-square tests, right? Uh, in this case, we just had P1 and P2. So we could do the whole Z test, which is two proportions. The next part here says, when should you use a chi-square test and when should you use a two-sample Z test? Well, remember a chi-square test, which is categorical, is equivalent to a two-sided z-test, which is quantitative. And by two-sided, we mean like the test we just did, the alternative hypothesis, was not equal to. So just remember that in general, a chi-squared test is for categorical data, and then a two-sided z-test, or a two-proportion z-test, is for quantitative data. In general, students typically find the chi-squared test to be easier. Okay, a couple other things I want to point out along those lines. There's no confidence intervals for chi-square. These are the last notes for the chapter, and we haven't talked about confidence intervals because there aren't any for chi-square. We just saw an example where we could use a two-sample z-test or a chi-squared test, but that was when there was only two proportions present. So the other thing I want to mention here is anything more than two treatments, you should absolutely use chi-square. Because then you don't just have P1 and P2. You have P1, P2, P3, P4, 
So if there's only two treatments, you could consider a two-sample z-test, but otherwise, if there's more than two treatments, use chi-square. Okay, the next question on these notes asks, how could we compare the distribution of AP scores at Lake Park and Wheaton North? So in my mind, I think how many fives, how many fours, how many threes? Like what are the distribution of scores from one to five for the AP exam? So we could start with, to compare the distributions, let's use a chi-square test for homogeneity. We have two populations, Lake Park students and Wheaton North. And we have one characteristic, and that characteristic being the distribution of AP scores. But if we wanted to compare the means only, we could do a two-sample z-test for mu1 minus mu2. So that's if we wanted to compare the distributions, which in this case I think is more interesting than just maybe the average AP score, because then you get to look at the distributions of fives compared to fours compared to threes. But if we just want to look at the average scores, which means just the means, then we could do a two-sample t-test for mu1 minus mu2 to see if they're different or the same. Okay, in the last part for these notes, it says, what can you do if some of the expected counts are less than five? So this would actually be no good for us because then one of our conditions would fail. And if you run across that, there is one fix. Um, you could combine rows or columns to make sure that that condition is met. For example, uh, in the social networking example, which was this one, uh, if we didn't have enough expected counts in each one, we could combine the categories. For example, just go from 18 to 34 and 35 to 54. I mean, all the expected counts here are definitely bigger than 5, but if we did run into that problem, we could have combined these columns. So if you run into a situation where your expected counts are less than 5, there is one sort of fix, which by fix we mean just combine rows or combined columns until you're able to meet that condition. All right, so that's all for chapter 11. We talked about using chi-square tests wisely, and that's actually all we're going to say for chi-square tests for now. That's all for these notes. I'll see you in class.